geeks and geekettes, ladies and gentlemen, seniors and senoritas, it is time once again for Ask Chuck Dixon, where you get to ask me, a comic book writer of world renown, questions about what I do for a living and what I do for a living is I write comic books. Uh, let's get right to the questions. Tom KP, uh, my personal favorite DC character is the Phantom Stranger, pre-New 52. What's your opinion on supernatural comic characters, and how does DC compare to Marvel in this regard? Well, as a uh, dyed-in-the-wool, long-time, lifelong uh, Ditko fan, Doctor Strange is, is my favorite mystic character, because um, Ditko really created a a reality all its own for Doctor Strange. The rules of how the magic works, the universe in which Doctor Strange exists, uh, the perils and challenges he faces are just so entirely unique and, and fresh, uh, even to this day. Uh, there's nothing really to compare, in my mind, to Doctor Strange. Uh, on the DC side, my favorite would be the Spectre. Um, I liked the Spectre when I was a kid. Uh, certainly a, a you know, spooky character as he inhabits, you know, the body of a re reanimated <laughs> uh, police detective. I mean, uh, pretty strange situation to begin with. Um, and my love of the Spectre was firmly cemented uh, by the 1970s appearances of the Spectre written by Michael Fleischer and drawn by Jim Aparo, in which the Spectre is uh, portrayed as a... Uh, a spirit of vengeance. A, uh, he, he brings justice to a world without justice. Uh, some terrific uh, you know, one, a series of one-shot stories featuring you know, the Spectre uh, in a um, series called The Wrath of the Spectre, quite aptly named. Um, generally, I, I don't care for supernatural characters. Um, <clears throat> I'm not big into magic. Uh, it's when I have to write magic, um, I, I find I have to create a finite set of rules for it. Because to me, in stories in which magic exists, anything can happen. And when anything can happen, who cares what does? You know, um, the magic characters are so often um, their own deus ex machina, where, you know, they just sort of magic their way out of situations. So there's no real sense of peril to my mind. But, you know, that's not to say that supernatural characters aren't extraordinarily successful. Um, much of the Vertigo line uh, was supernatural horror-based characters. So, um, and they were extremely successful at it. As I've said before, uh, Vertigo comics didn't really appeal to me, but I wasn't the audience for Vertigo comics. But I do applaud the fact that they created their own look, their own feel, and uh, mostly because they they did a lot to reach out and find a new audience for comic readers. And um, most of that was of the uh, magical, mystical bent. Hey, Twin Spin! Uh, was that a Twin Spin? I might have put the Twin Spin in the wrong place. Anyway, Ophi Ophi, hi Chuck, are you a fan of Dean Cain? Have you met... What are your thoughts on the Lois and Clark TV series? It's totally 90s, and I love it today as much as back then. I don't really have a brief one way or the other on Dean Cain. I've, I've never met him. I hear from everybody. that He's just a super, super nice guy. And um, what I will say is I I enjoyed him as Superman. I thought he, uh, he acquitted himself well on that role. But what I admire him for even more so is, you know, for some strange reason, I mean, I watched the show in the 90s. Largely because my wife liked it. And my wife's not really into comics or anything else. But she really got into watching uh, Lois and Clark. And um, what impressed me most about Dean Cain, uh, other than his performance as Superman, was that he wrote an episode of the series, which undeniably is the best episode of the series, and showed a sharp, keen understanding of the Superman character and how to construct a... Um, an interesting and engaging Superman story. And I think, you know, it is by far uh, the episode that he wrote stood head and shoulders above anything else done by the uh, regular writers on the series. And um, in case you were curious, my wife agreed. 
She really, she really enjoyed that episode as well. Okay, Escovitz. I want to start collecting, reading old Western comics. Old being anything from the 1950s to the 1970s. But I'm having trouble knowing where to begin. Which titles, characters do you suggest? Well, you can't go wrong with the, uh, own, I guess, 20-year-long run on The Long Ranger, as uh, written by Paul S. Newman and drawn by, um, oh my God, I'm drawing a blank on his name. <laughs> Oh, uh, John, John, yeah. Oh, man, I can't remember his name. Uh, oh, yeah, there's a bunch of people screaming at the screen right now. <laughs> I own a bunch of his original artwork, and I can't remember the guy's name right now. The sign of age. Anyway, um, uh, these are excellent comics. I mean, the great Western comics. I mean, obviously, they had gorgeous painted covers. And uh, Dell had a... Uh, a knack for doing, you know, consistently entertaining uh, Western comics. And, um, man, his name was Tom. Damn. Damn, you're all screaming. You're all screaming. All you old-time fans are like, you idiot, can't you remember that? Anyway, Lone Ranger comics. And they're surprisingly, for the age of them, I don't know what prices they're at now, but when I was buying them back in the early 2000s, they were, and late 90s, they were um, surprisingly Tom Gill. Tom Gill. Okay, uh, I'm, I'm redeemed. Uh, <laughs> they're surprisingly affordable, largely because Dell kept back, uh, Dell kept a huge inventory of file copies. Um, so there's no shortage of these comics. Uh, because Dell kept, you know, file copies, there's a lot of, there's a lot of like primo, um, uh, near mint condition copies out there. Uh, most of my Lone Ranger collection is in awesome condition given the age of the comics because they're former file copies. The other thing is it keeps these um, down in price or should keep them down in price is, is, is that, you know, this book sold about a million copies a month. So there's no shortage of uh, copies of these Lone Ranger comics out there. So it's a good place to start a collection because, you know, they're vintage comics, but they're not completely priced out of... Um, out of the range of affordability, unless things have changed since I was buying them. Um, Dell continued to do terrific Western comics. Um, I would recommend the uh, series of Wyatt Earp comics as drawn by um, Russ Manning. And uh, Have Gun Will Travel had a, a terrific um, set of um, issues uh, by uh, Gia Liddy. Uh, from terrific Italian artist uh, who, who worked, who did the bulk of the run on Torak. Um, and of course, the Zorro issues by Alex Toth. And again, because these sold so well, uh, of course, some of these are a little pricier because we're getting later in the, into the 60s at Dell. Uh, sales weren't as big. Uh, there's still you know, hundreds of thousands of copies out there, but not quite as many as there would be from a 50s comic. And I'd like to recommend these two issues of Laramie, a mostly forgotten hour-long Western used to air on NBC. Largely because one of them is penciled by Gil Kane and inked by Russ Heath, which is an awesome combination. You had the this liveliness of Gil Kane's pencils and, um, and then Heath's you know, meticulous attention to detail. And then the second one is uh, penciled and inked by Russ Heath. If you watch these videos, you know what an enormous fan of Russ Heath I am. And uh, they're, they're, you know, both issues are, have great stories in them. But uh, the added uh, attraction of Mr. Heath's, you know, amazing inking abilities. A series I like, and is completely forgotten by everybody except, you know, Western geeks, is um, the Atlas series, uh, Atlas series and character Arrowhead. Um, he was an Indian warrior. Uh, he's sort of a frontier Conan type character. And, um, uh, he appeared in a, a short lived series of his own, but he also appeared in, you know, books like, you know, two gun kid and things like that as a backup feature. Uh, and, and, and Atlas, the, Atlas is the company that would later become Marvel. Um, they did a lot of Westerns. They, they, they had a lot of, you know, Gunsmoke Western was an anthology, Thrilling Western, 
Western thrillers. I mean, they just pack the stands with terrific uh, Western titles. But Arrowhead is one of my favorite characters. And all of the stories are drawn, uh, penciled, and inked by Joe Sinnott. Uh, Sinnott was most famous for, you know, being a regular inker over Jack Kirby on Fantastic Four in its, you know, glory days. But Sinnott was a a terrific um, artist as well, uh, and he contributed a lot to Western and war series at Atlas. And um, it's largely forgotten now, but to my mind, he was the equal uh, to guys like Russ Heath and John Severn uh, for his attention to historical detail, his bravura art style, and uh, you know, just uh, just really good stuff. Another series largely forgotten um, is Death Valley. And these were a series of Western anthology stories. Um, and almost all of them in every issue, uh, including the covers, are uh, drawn by Don Heck. And you know, Heck, who would later become you know, a Marvel staple with Iron Man and, and other characters, um, never became a fan favorite because... And, and I think the reason for that is because I don't think he was particularly interested in the superhero genre. Uh, but boy, he was really good at crime and Western and war stuff. And uh, Death Valley is a terrific, um, serves as a terrific example of what uh, Heck could do as a, as a storyteller and draftsman. And um, good, dynamic, solid stuff with you know that Don Heck touch. And recently... One of the greatest uh, series that ran from the late 40s into the 50s, early 50s, was American Eagle. It appeared in prize Western uh, comics. Um, and it, I think the stories are written by Jerry DeFuccio, if I'm not mistaken, uh, probably also written by John Severn himself. And it's just a fun series of, uh, you know, Indian stories, Plains Indian stories, and cavalry stories. And... Um, it's recently been lovingly collected in a huge hardcover. It's a little pricey, but a lot cheaper than buying the issues themselves. Um, but it's, it's, uh, I believe fancy graphics. Uh, I might be wrong about that, but it's a, uh, uh, terrific collection, lovingly restored all the covers, every single John Severn story that ever appeared in prize comics. Um, you know, uh, even the ones that didn't feature American Eagle. And it's a, it's a great place to start on 50s Westerns. And um, like I said, pricey, but to me worth it because it's uh, there's a lot of value here. And it's it's worth taking a look at. Roberto Dun Dungato. Uh, and speaking of Netflix, what do you think of streaming services like Netflix or Amazon taking a page from Disney and gobbling up smaller niche nostalgia IPs and repackaging them into updated series, not just from American productions such as uh, Masters of the Universe, but also local IPs from other countries? Um, yeah, I just think the streaming thing. I mean, from what I read in the business section of the Wall Street Journal, you know, Netflix is winning this whole streaming war thing. Um, its closest competitor would be Amazon. And Amazon doesn't even need to win the streaming thing because Amazon Prime, the, the video service, is just its just a little tiny part of, of, you know, the global monstrosity that is Amazon. But, I, you know, they're all looking for IP that people recognize the name of. I mean, they're, they're scraping the bottom of the barrel for properties that, like, you know, people may have heard of once. <laughs> so there's some degree of fam familiarity. Um, and But to me, they just keep doing the same take and telling the same story over and over and over again. Um, there's definitely a formula to these things. And um, it, it all makes me kind of sad. And, and, and the other problem, of course, with them taking beloved IPs is, you know, they, they, they hand them over to creators who don't really care about the original IP certainly don't care about the fans of the original IP. Uh, and they just sort of turn it into a, a pet project of their own. Um, you know, 
basically it's just a job. If there's no passion or anything else there, uh, like I hear, you know, I'm, I'm, like I hear with Masters of the Universe that it's just been totally gutted and ravaged and um, you know torn apart by the creators working on it, and we see this over and over and over again, where they'll they'll basically abuse the public's tr trust. Like we're going to take this property that you love, that you knew as a child or whatever, and uh, we're going to completely upend it and, and, and to serve our own purposes or, you know, update it for modern audiences, which, oh my God, that's just horrible. Uh, why, you know, because by doing that, they've, they've made it more bland. They've made it less um, edgy. They've made it duller. And uh, they've also, you know, race swapped and gender swapped the characters out of all recognition until it just becomes um, that IP property uh, in name only. And that's what we're seeing over and over again. And I think it's sad. Hey, if you haven't subscribed, please do so. Uh, we're building this channel. I'm, I'm inching closer and closer to 10,000 subscribers. And if you could help out, and if you've already helped out, well, a big, gigantic Ask Chuck Dixon thank you to you. Pat yourself on the back. Craig Jowles, or Jowles, I'm from the UK and grew up on anthology titles such as 2000 AD, Eagle, and Battle. I love the format. It's a great way to introduce old and new characters to readers. Both Marvel and DC have had success in the past with this format, but for the longest time, it seems like they haven't been able to make them work. What do you think the reason for this is? Well, I think largely it's the way these things are marketed, the way they're sold, and also the buying habits. Um, you know, in the UK, as, as you well know, because uh, you live there and grew up there and love the comics there, your comics were presented weekly at a news agent's. So every week you were getting a little bit of, like getting a little hit of Roy and the Rovers, a little hit of Judge Dredd, uh, knowing that the following week you would get more of the story. Uh, whereas in the United States, it's comics have always been a monthly medium. It's a 30-day wait until your next uh, hit of that character. Um, so I think that on the weekly format, the anthology thing works. Also, this is the way comics were presented to people in the UK. Uh, this is the way they're used to reading them. So they're used to following a story week by week, a little bit at a time. And they're also used to the comic having lots of different features in it. Uh, you know, uh, and, I, and I assume as a, a consumer of these things, you, you, you had features that you really liked. And features that you thought were, eh, they're okay. And features you didn't care for at all and didn't read. But, but you know, you uh, were still exposed to them. And I, I, I think because of the monthly thing, anthologies just don't work here. Anthologies are like a dirty word. Um, and they don't really seem to market comics that way anymore. I mean, when I was growing up, you know, uh, like DC Comics had a lead feature and a backup. You know, you, you had, you know, Batman in the front of Detective Comics and Green Arrow backup in, in the back. Um, and then Marvel, because they had limited access to printing presses, had anthology titles like Strange Tales and Journey Mystery and Tales of Suspense and Tales to Astonish, where the issue was, each issue was split between two characters. Uh, but, you know, they, as soon as World Press installed new presses, a, a second press, uh, Marvel was able to expand its line. Hey, you probably didn't know. That's why they had those uh, two for titles back in the 60s, uh, because there simply wasn't enough press time uh, to allow Marvel to expand its line, even though its characters were becoming more and more popular. That's why they would double them up. Uh, so they, you know, they would keep exposing comic book readers to Iron Man and Submariner and Captain America, but they, they, they couldn't, there was no room, there was no real estate to allow them to uh, have their own titles. But yeah, I mean, so, so the anthology comic in the United States was done out of necessity. In the UK, it's, it's done because that's, 
like a reading tradition. And, and, and it grows out of, you know, the weekly um, newspapers for juveniles that have been a tradition in England for 150 years, uh, with, you know, where you would have serialized stories of characters like Sexton Blake and, and others. Um, and so the comics just sort of followed that format of the weekly paper. And she's 150 years. The weekly newspaper with the serialized story probably goes back more like 200 years in Britain. I mean, Charles Dickens was originally serialized in weekly newspapers, much the way that Judge Dredd is today. Um, now, I would like to see something like that. I would like to see because because American comic sales are failing. I don't know. I don't know how things are doing in the UK. They seem, from an outsider's point of view, to be doing pretty well. Um, you know, you still have weekly comics that seem like they're pretty healthy. I mean, I, from production values and price point and everything else, I, I assume they sell. Uh, you know, unless their publishers are doing it just out of the goodness of their heart. Um, if, if that that's you know presupposing publishers have hearts, but um, I would like to see something like this. Now, don't go looking for this. This is something I put together of my own. I would like to see a magazine-sized um, anthologies of of American comic characters, and they would be at a price point similar to the uh, like you know Time Life books we see now about Elvis or James Bond, and um, you know do something like this, and and don't you know take the uh, take a hint from the the British weeklies. Take a hint from the Japanese uh, anthology books and just make the covers as garish and as hey kids as you can. And, um, you know, do something that both the Japanese and the UK publishers used to do. Every once in a while, shrink it, shrink wrap the issue with a tchotchke. Um, I, I used to get uh, UK weeklies back in the 70s and they would come shrink wrapped with, you know, you know, uh, a cardboard ray gun you would fold together, you know, things like that. Um, really, you know, aim them at kids, market them toward kids to try to get some interest, um, you know, try to breathe some life back into this dying, dying, sad, pathetic um, American comic book market. Twin spin. Back in the 70s, Marvel got the license to produce Star Wars comics. This move has been regarded as saving Marvel at the time when they were struggling with sales. Given that Warner owns DC and, and have a huge catalog of IP, why do you think DC hasn't tried to capitalize on this? Well, lack of interest, indifference. There's not a lot of cooperation between Warners and DC Comics. I don't think there's a lot of give and take. Uh, well, there's a lot of take from Warners. Uh, but there's not there's not a lot of give <laughs> for DC, um, but yeah, Warner's has the rights to properties. I've talked about Dirty Harry before. I had proposed the Dirty Harry Batman crossover comic, which you know Warner's was pretty excited about until Clint Eastwood himself nixed the idea. And um, now, now I don't think Clint Eastwood owns the rights to Dirty Harry, but um, he certainly, by cult of personality, has some say over. Um, it's weird how these things work. They're not legally contracted in these ways, but you don't, you don't want to make Mr. Eastwood mad. And so he didn't want to be portrayed in a comic book. And that's cool uh, because that's, you know, that's the way it is. Now, Warner's has the film rights to Harry Potter, but apparently J.K. Rowling hates comics and won't, you know, won't sign off on doing uh, what would be a tremendously, uh, it would be a publishing phenomenon for comics. Um, can you imagine a, a series of graphic novels done by uh, top talent, either in the UK or, or the United States? And I know a lot of comic book creators who would simply kill, they'd climb over, you know, they'd climb over each other to get at this property because they like it. And also the, uh, the, you know, uh, monetary rewards would be huge. The royalties would be enormous on a Harry Potter graphic novel project. And not to blow your mind, but imagine a series of Harry Potter Potter mangas uh, be like printing money. 
I mean, it would be enormously successful. But Rowling doesn't like comics, and that's the end of that, even though Warner's, you know, I, I doubt very much she sold Warner's the graphic novel rights, because I know I've seen Warner's contracts, and if you sign any kind of film or TV contract with Warner's, it always includes the graphic novel rights, which I always tell writers, don't sign off on that, because they'll never make a comic of your novel. Uh, you know, you could do that yourself. Uh, but, you know, when you sign with Hollywood, they want everything. They want every right. They want, you know, radio broadcasting rights on Jupiter. Um, another property that Warner owns the film rights to is The Exorcist. Uh, although now, I guess, maybe Universal owns it. Because uh, Universal is doing a series of Exorcist movies. But, you know, there was a time Warner's had the rights. And it seemed to me Exorcist would have been uh, prime uh, for, as we mentioned before, Vertigo. Uh, horror comics. Lethal Weapon, as far as I know, Warner Brothers still owns the rights to Lethal Weapon. Uh, you know, that would be a fun comic book series. I mean, why the heck not? And uh, The Matrix. Um, I, I don't believe there have been Matrix comics. Uh, probably the, uh, the Warshawski brothers or sisters or whatever gender they happen to be at the moment. Uh, perhaps they kept graphic novel rights because I know they are uh, they are into comics, so maybe they didn't sign off on that. Triple spin! Craig Joel's back again with sticking with Batman. You you are not a fan of Dark Knight Returns, but you, but are you a fan of Batman Year One? I I enjoyed Batman Year One. I think it might be Batman Year One and Daredevil Born Again are probably my favorite Frank Miller uh, properties. I think they're they, they show him at the peak of his talents. Um, I will say this, though. Uh, I don't think Batman Year One works as a Batman Year One story. Uh, I'm, and I'm not the first person to say this. Um, it's more of a Commissioner Gordon Year One story. There's nothing wrong with that. It's a, it's a very compelling story. I really enjoy it. And I, I enjoy the Batman aspects of it, too. But if you read it, it's it's the story's largely driven by Gordon. And Gordon kind of takes up all the Takes up, he takes up all the oxygen in the story. Not that I'm complaining. I mean, it's a good story. I just don't think it's properly a Batman Year One story. Uh, it's more of a, a police thriller that Batman appears in. Which, again, cool. I'm, I'm cool with that. Tom Long. I read Alias and really liked it. I saw that it was created by Tom Caputo and Catherine Llewellyn with Now Comics, Caputo Publishing, holding the original copyright. I'd love to hear any details you can share about working on a series, the changing of the copyright to you and Todd Fox, and how it found its way to Antarctic. Um, well, okay, let me deal with the, the, the creation issue. The creation, Tony Caputo and Catherine Llewellyn, Catherine Llewellyn, who was you know, the main editor at Now, uh, who, you know, just, she was terrific to work with, really enjoyed working with her. Um, their creation of Alias was to approach me and say, we want to do this book called Alias, and it's about a serial killer who is a hitman, also a hitman at the same time. And that is the beginning and end of their contribution. That is the Alpha and Omega, the high concept of it, which is an excellent one, excellent idea, of a serial killer turned hitman, a guy who, um, you know, much like Dexter in the series Dexter, which would come later, a serial killer who, um, you know, vents himself, uh, who utilizes his personal psychosis into um, a, you know, something he sees as positive, <laughs> a money-making proposition. Uh, he's going to kill people anyway. Why not get paid for it? And, you know, also the idea in mind that maybe some of the people he's killing deserve it. Uh, and, but, but none of those moral um, uh, considerations or anything else were, were in the simple sentence, how about a series about a guy who is a serial killer who becomes hitman? And so it was up to me to sort of take it from there and me and Todd Fox and uh, Enrique Villagran, you know, worked up the series until now stopped paying us. And um, the originals for the original series, you know, sat in my flat files for decades. 
And I finally said, you know, hey, this is ridiculous. Um, nobody's ever been able to read the end of this story. Uh, for all this time, I would get constantly get questions about it. How did the story end? Um, where did it go? And so uh, I approached, uh, the, you know, uh, Ben Dunn and, and Joe Dunn at Antarctic because they're good guys and I've known them for a very, very long time. And I said, would you guys want to, you know, put this out in a series of um, uh, black and white editions shot from the original art because I had all the original art. And so we did it. Now, the copyright issue, um, there was no copyright issue because now comics had never copyrighted Alias. Uh, I did a copyright search. Alias is there in uh, the Library of Congress, but was never copyrighted. And so uh, I copyrighted it to uh, myself and Todd Fox, and we were off to the races in Antarctic. So, you know, hats off to uh, Tony Caputo and, and, and Kate Llewellyn, and I, give, I probably give most credit to Kate Llewellyn for coming up with it. But, um, you know, it, it went from that high concept to what, you know, Todd and Enrique and I eventually developed into the series that you enjoyed. So thanks for the kind words about it as well. Um, yeah, I blanked out the name here. Uh, somebody, Wenzel. <laughs> Is it Anthony? Okay. Oh, hello, Mr. Dixon. As you've written Westerns and are a fan, I'm wondering what you consider what you consider a Western as some of my friends and I have been discussing whether something is a Western or a frontier story. Does era matter? Is it pre or post American Western expansion actually a Western? Example, Last of Mohican, Zorro, Yellowstone. Or are more factors involved like hero relationship to his horse, family, friends, duty, and honor? Well, as I always say, a Western is a pretty simple genre. Uh, as a famous Italian movie producer once said, I like watching Westerns because if I fall asleep in the middle, uh, when I wake up, I still know what's going on. And largely what a Western, traditional Western is, is um, a series of conflicts, man against man, man against nature, man against himself, whatever. A series of conflicts are developed, you know, risks rise, um, consequences rise, and to a point where the only way out, the only way to resolve the issues of the story is through violence. Uh, bringing us, you know, to the final gunfight, the final Indian raid, the final cavalry charge, whatever. That's, uh, that's what a Western is. It's a story where the conflicts can only be resolved by the deaths of, you know, one or more principles in the story so that the other people can go on to be happy. <laughs> oh, and there's as many permutations of this story as you can imagine. The Western can be twisted and warped into anything from, from a comedy Western to Italian Westerns to, uh, you know, what they call adult Westerns in the 50s. Uh, to the mean Westerns of the 70s, and they're all still Westerns because they follow the idea of conflict and resolution through violence. And uh, now Zorro, it's set in the early 1800s in California. It is certainly set in the West. But to my mind, Zorro is a swashbuckler. It's not really about conflicts being resolved through violence, even though many of the conflicts in the story are but it's largely an adventure story. It's largely a swashbuckler uh, story. Most Zorro stories could just as easily have been set in Europe. Uh, they didn't need to be set in the American West. There's not that many Western elements that appear in a Zorro story as they do in a standard you know, Western action story. Uh, Last of the Mohicans, to me, is that that's historical adventure. Um, it's, it's not, even though once again, uh, the, the problems in the story are resolved through violence, um, this isn't a traditional Western, um, that we think of, um, even though it features many of the aspects of, um, a traditional Western. To me, it's, it's a historical adventure. And plus it doesn't take place in the West. <laughs> All the action in this story 
takes place, you know, east of the Ohio River for the most part, uh, in the eastern portion of the country. Uh, which, as you'll see later, it doesn't matter where a story takes place; it can still be a western. Uh, it's like Little House in the Prairie. You know, Little House in the Prairie is set in the West. It has a lot of the features of the West. You know, the frontier life. Uh, threat from hostiles, threat from strangers, um, you know, uh, failures of crops and, and things like that. Uh, excellent TV series to my mind, but it's not a Western because, you know, in a few episodes, uh, Mr. Ingalls uh, solves his problems with his fists. And uh, in one memorable, memorable episode in the final season, actually goes out with you know, a gun to take care of things. But, but for the most part, Little House on the Prairie was... Um, you know, adventure stories or humor or, you know, and that was the great thing about Little House on the Prairie. It was each week you didn't know what to expect. Uh, but, you know, expertly written, engaging stories, that, but, but never a Western in, in my mind. Um, Yellowstone, yeah, I think it's very much a Western because each season comes to this, you know, violent climax for the most part. Um, the, the Duttons certainly, you know, take care of their problems utilizing violence. Uh, they are up against the same kind of rising stakes uh, that you see in a good Western. Um, the pot's boiling and uh, throughout each season. And generally, um, you know, the guns come out. Uh, and you know, I think Yellowstone very, very much a Western despite the fact that it's set in the modern day. But, you know, anything can be a Western. I mean, Road Warrior is, it's a Western. What else can you say? It's a John Ford. It's a post-apocalyptic John Ford movie. Um, and I think Mad Max, for the most part, is a Western. It's, it's man against nature. It's man against man. Um, when you think about it, the, the, the classic American Western, it is kind of a post-apocalyptic environment that the stories are set against. You know, you have this, these, these bleak landscapes and it's a hostile land. It's a hostile situation. Um, and you're, you're in a place where the law is fungible. <laughs> you know, there's no real rule of law except that, uh, that can be enforced at the point of a gun. So it's, you know, that's why we say the wild, wild west. It was wild. And so um, I think Road Warrior uh, fits the genre in a lot of ways. Uh, okay, greetings from Delco, PA, Delaware County, Pennsylvania, where I grew up. I know you're a big film buff, so I was wondering what are your thoughts on the great Warner Brothers gangster cycle of the 1930s? I love them all, from Little Caesar in 31 to the Roaring Twenties in 1939. However, I think my favorites are the two made a decade later when James Cagney came back to do White Heat and Edward G. Robinson did Key Largo. Cody Jarrett and Johnny Rocco were older, meaner, scarier, and a lot less likable than the antiheroes of the 30s. I think a lot more complex and interesting. Uh, I got to agree with you. I mean, um, you know, basically post-war, uh, the, you know, the audiences weren't going to be as into the uh, charismatic anti-hero gangster that they were in the 30s. Uh, they, I think World War II had shown uh, both Americans at home and Americans who had served abroad uh, to some part, some degree, a true face of evil they had never seen before. Uh, and also just the realities of war itself uh, made the audience uh, more jaded, uh, more grown up. Uh, more willing to face the reality uh, and less less uh, less less interested in fantasy um, in 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 a in a genre like crime. Um, so they wanted their heroes more like the real world, and certainly James Cagney as Cody Jarrett, a uh, psychotic uh, killer. Uh, suffers migraines, has a mother fixation. He's much more complex. He's much more dangerous. He's much meaner than than we had seen Jimmy Cagney before. Uh, the Cagney charm is gone in this character. And this is a movie that 
Cagney had to be really pressured into being. He did not want to return to this genre, uh, but I'm everyone's so glad he did because this caps his career as a uh, a crime movie guy. He would never do another crime film, um, and but this one is you know, White Heat is awesome. I mean, I rewatched it recently, and um, it it still feels fresh today after all these years. I mean, uh, all the classic scenes in this uh, movie really deliver and uh Cagney like he owns this movie uh even though he didn't want to make it he, he put all of his heart and soul uh into it and uh, just excellent portrayal of a, a complete and utter sociopath same thing for Edward G. Robinson and Key Largo I mean you gotta, you gotta hate this guy he's like one of the most cruel most sadistic characters ever to be in film he he's uh he's one of these like evil satanic uh just nasty dudes who has no feel at all. He has no heart. He has no soul. And he's just so sadistic and just enjoys tormenting people. The, the scene where he makes his, his girlfriend sing for everybody, it's like it's excruciatingly cruel. I mean, you'd rather he just shot everybody dead. It would, it would seem to be more merciful. But, you know, and Robinson, you know, I don't know how he felt about being in this movie, but, you know, it's his... Uh, it's also, you know, except for a few turns as uh, in cameos and things as gangsters, this would be his last uh, turn as as a crime figure. And just, uh, you know, like you said, it's a more mature portrayal. It's it's a you know far less likable and far less charismatic than uh, his previous roles. Um, Bogart as well. Uh, Bogart in uh, the Desperate Hours. Uh, plays a uh, you know sort of a small time hood um, who um, keeps you guessing throughout the film as to where his moral compass lies. How far is he willing to take abducting this suburban family in order? He's a recently escaped convict, uh, and and him and his uh, his his crew take up residence in this uh, suburban household and hold the family hostage as they try to figure out how the hell to get through the dragnet. Uh, that the police have thrown up around the community. Uh, and it's a great turn for Bogart uh, to play a meaner character like this. Now, of the 30s movies, crime movies, my absolute favorite is uh, I Was a Fugitive from a Chain Gang. Uh, it's Paul Muni as a guy falsely accused of a crime and gets sent you know, through the prison system in the most brutal, cruel, uh, inhumane way. And uh, the film was very much done as an expose of the way um, the incarcerated were treated in this country. And, uh, but it's also a fantastic portrait of someone driven to desperation. Uh, it's an excellent movie. And if you've never seen it, I really should. I was a fugitive from a chain gang. And it, it, if you watch it for no other reason, watch it for its ending. It has one of the most unforgettable endings of any movie I've ever seen. Absolutely. I'm, I'm getting chills just thinking about the ending of that movie. It's just absolutely brilliant um, ending, a uh, perfect ending to a film like this. Now, another guy uh, who did crime movies uh, in the era you're talking about, the 1950s post-war, uh, Sterling Hayden, um, who... Um, just if you don't know Sterling Hayden, you, you might remember him from The Godfather. He's the cop who gets shot in the throat by Michael Corleone. Um, he almost was cast as Quint in Jaws, um, but he um, he made a for me a trio of terrific crime films in the fifties. Uh, number one of which is Asphalt Jungle, written by John Huston. It's about a jewelry heist and and the aftermath as the gang sort of falls apart. Uh, the film is largely famous for an early speaking role by Marilyn Monroe, but uh, Hayden owns this movie. It's, it's beautifully shot. Um, and like I said about White Heat, Asphalt Jungle feels fresh today. After all, it's like a timeless movie. Uh, Houston is just at the top of his game. Well, it's very lean, very mean, very nasty, a uh, crime film about a heist, uh, a gang of heisters who uh, have a bit of a falling out 
and the aftermath of that. Now, another great film, uh, this is the uh, directed by Stanley Kubrick. It's an early Kubrick film. It also stars Sterling Hayden. It's called The Killing, and it's about a robbery of a racetrack. Um, uh, and like Asphalt Jungle, this movie is about you know small-time heisters uh, led by Sterling Hayden. And like Asphalt Jungle, it sort of cranks up the tension between the group. But the killing does an even better job than Asphalt Jungle of cranking up the tension. Uh, after the crime is committed, is this gang going to be able to hold together? And um, it, it, everything reaches this amazing flashpoint toward the end of the film. But it's, um, it is a, it, it, it's a terrific crime film. Now, now, another crime film with Sterling Hayden, which to me completes his 50s trilogy, um, is a movie called Crime Wave. Now, in this one, Hayden is a, a tough, tough cop. He's a tough police detective. But um, he's following up on a bunch of uh, low-life hoods who, who killed a guy in a gas station robbery. And uh, he, he's just doggedly going to hunt these guys down. One of the, one of the gang played by uh, Charles Bronson in an earlier role uh, very effectively by Charles Bronson. So that's a good one to look for as well. It's called Crime Wave. And um, I, I rewatch this one like a couple of times a year because it's just so perfectly constructed. Just, you know, seamless you know, cop thriller, seamless crime thriller from the period that you mentioned. Tim Gilpin. Hi, Chuck. I recently came across an issue of What If You Wrote, published around 1990. The title says it all. What if the Punisher killed Spider-Man? Story's good and tight with clever touches, such as the Punisher's tactical knowledge beating his target's spider sense. The Daily Bugle mourning Spidey's death and other Marvel heroes hunting down the Punisher for his crime. The appropriately grim ending shows the Punisher about to kill the Jackal, the man who duped him into the murder, despite the room full of NYPD cops who will finish him. Did you write other what-if stories, or was this your only issue? Uh, yeah, I wrote a few others during the time that Nell Yamtov was editor of What If. Uh, I was, I was, he was editing Law Dog, the comic that Flynn Henry and I created. And Nell, you know, needed content. So he would turn to me, you know, you know hey, you don't want to do some what-ifs. And some of the proposed, like the uh, the two part, what if Captain America were revived today? He he asked me to uh, to write this one, and it was one of the few what if two parters. And uh, you know, I had a good time on this stuff. I mean, it was getting to play in the Marvel mainstream in a way, in an alternate universe, freed from continuity, so I could just go crazy. Um, now, some of them, um, I, I proposed this one: uh, what if the Silver Surfer had uh, not betrayed Galactus? Um, this is one of my favorites to write. Um, and uh, my only disappointment with this one was that I, I got a personal promise from Ron Friends to draw it, and then he, he couldn't. He had scheduling problems, or they had wooed him away to something else, and he didn't get to draw it. Uh, I mean, I, I, it, it was fine. I, I, I forget who drew the issue, and I liked it and everything else, but I really wanted Ron Friends to bring it that, uh, that Kirby feel. Um, I also did uh, What If the Fantastic Four had Remained a Team, the new Fantastic Four had Remained a Team, and um, uh, that's one Nell Yamtov brought to me. I uh, said, so, you know, we, we really like to do this. And uh, I got to work with Kike Alcatena on this one, and um, I got to do a gag about uh, Herbie the robot <laughs> from, the, from the old Fantastic Four animated series. So I got to do a gag about that, which was a highlight for me. Uh, but, um, it, you know, it was a lot of fun to work on this one as well. And, and as you said, what if the Punisher had killed Spider-Man? I also got to do what if Punisher had become a S.H.I.E.L.D. agent. And I think, I think uh, Nell, that was one Nell proposed. Uh, what if Punisher killed Spider-Man? That was me. I was all over that one. I wanted to do that one real bad. <laughs> so, but yeah, so I got to do a bunch of what if. I had a good time on all of them. Uh, I probably would have done more, but they changed editors. And you know how that is. Okay. Oh, man, I got I to gotta stop. Hang on. I got to. This is ridiculous. I, uh, I'm not getting people's names right. All right, let's move that down there. Okay, let's go back down here. This is how I do these live. <laughs> there's, no, there's no post on this show, my friends. It's all what you see is what you get. Anyway, uh, my apologies to the other people whose first names I didn't get because I blocked them out like an idiot. 
All right, Daryl Herrick. You mentioned Denny O'Neill as an editor, but how would you appraise him as a comic book writer? I first took notice of Denny O'Neill when he and Neil Adams were the focus of Hoopla around the relevance in comic books and their work on Green Lantern and Green Arrow. I followed his concurrent work with the Batman and other characters afterwards. In a few words, in my opinion, Denny O'Neill definitely blended motif and the modicum of real emotion to craft a satisfying story. Um, yeah, I mean, the thing about Denny was that he was really good at bringing out the humanity of his characters. Um, now, sometimes, like when he was doing relevant, you know, what, what, what you call and what everyone at the time was calling relevant stories, I thought, you know, you, his heart was a little bit too on his sleeve, <laughs> you know, trying to bring out the humanity of these characters. And, um, but some of that goes to Neil Adams. And if you ever talked to Denny, made the mistake of mentioning Green Lantern and Green Arrow to Denny, Denny would go off on how Neil had changed some of his stories. Um, uh, Neil would take what Denny had written and sort of uh, hype up the emotion levels on it so that uh, the characters are constantly raging. Uh, and, you know, to, to Denny's mind, Neil took the stories over the top uh, without asking Denny about it. And when Denny would talk about it, it, it was like it happened yesterday. <laughs> so it was a topic you really don't want to bring up, which just goes to show how passionate Denny was about writing comics. He was the real deal. Um, I mean, this is a guy who started out as a journalist. No idea he would ever be writing comic books. But when he did write comic books, he took his job real, real seriously. And um, I think that shows in, you know, how he would able to present these characters as, as real human beings. He certainly made Batman a more three-dimensional, more human character. Um, and not necessarily just by showing him with flaws, you know, or any of the rest of it, but just showing, you know, this is a guy, he's a real dude. Uh, he has wants and desires. Uh, he has concerns. Uh, and, you know, you see this again and again in, in Denny O'Neill's characters, these tough guys who have traumatic pasts and, uh, you know, they're smart, they're capable, they're tough, but they're still, they're still men. Uh, they're still people. And I, and, and I think this comes out most in um, Denny O'Neill's short run on Superman which is a title Denny did not want to do. He had no interest in writing Superman, but they assigned it to him and they really wanted him to work the same magic on Superman he had on Batman. And to my mind, uh, he succeeded. I really, really like that run on Superman. And whenever I would bring it up to Denny, he would go, yeah, I didn't, I didn't want to write that. I didn't want, you know, yeah, but you couldn't tell he didn't want to write it because he really did a lot of thinking about Superman and it took him you know, a way with, without deconstructing him, without lessening the character, uh, he sort of drew him away from that iconic, stoic, Boy Scout image into something more like a flesh and blood character. Um, and if you ever get to read, I think it's been collected. It's probably two hundred dollars on Amazon now. I think they collected it like ten years ago. But if you can ever hunt down those issues of Superman by Denny O'Neill, and of course they're beautifully drawn by Kurt Swan with inks by Murphy Anderson, I mean, just some of the best Superman comics ever done. And I think anybody who's worked on Superman would agree with me. And uh, to me, it gave me a whole new look into a character that I thought I knew and that I, that I liked. Uh, but Denny brought a, uh, an aspect, a, a depth to the character to my mind that, um, I think resonates to today. So yeah, high estimation of Mr. O'Neill as, as a writer, as well as an editor. Alex Richmond, did you have any tropes or cliches you relied upon in your early comic book writing days? Things like overly used words, plot contrivances, etc. kind of storytelling crutches that most writers talk about looking back on in their early work and cringing at. On the flip side, do you think it's possible to go too far when trying to avoid tropes and cliches in writing comics? I, yeah, I mean, I never, you want to avoid the cliches. You want to avoid the tropes. They're there, but you want to kind of turn them on their head. Um, you want to use them in a different way. You want to, 
you want to do that thing that every writer always thinks, which is, which you should be thinking all day long if you're a writer. Is there a better way to say this? Is there a better way to present this? And um, and that means n newer, fresher. Um, yeah, there's some stuff. I wrote some stuff early in my career where the stories are rather predictable and all the rest. But as as feeling my way as a uh, writer, I'm not apologizing for that work. Uh, I wrote it earnestly. Um, I didn't phone it in. It, but you know, I was learning. I was learning my craft. I was learning how to tell stories. I was learning how to take stories and try to exceed the reader's expectations rather than meet them. I mean, when you get a writing assignment, you want to not screw it up. But not screwing it up isn't enough. You've got to really think, what does the reader want in this story, and how can I add to that? How can I give them more? An example of this is, you know, as pictured here, the famous cliff sequence in Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. Butch and Sundance are being chased by lawmen, and they end up at the edge of a cliff over a river. You know, it's hundreds of feet beneath them. And, you know, this is a typical Western scene. The good guys are, are trapped. Uh, there's no way out and everything else. But what's great about this scene is even though, we, you know, geez, everybody did it. John Wayne did it. Roy Rogers did it. Every, every, you know, every Western star had a scene like this. What's great about this scene is that William Goldman, the screenwriter, completely rethinks it. And uh, and comes up with this marvelous scene where um, Butch is trying to convince Sundance to jump off the cliff with him. They'll take their chances jumping in the river rather than uh, being captured by the lawman and certainly be hung. Uh, and that's when Robert Redford reveals that he can't swim. He's he's not he's not afraid. He's not a coward, but he can't swim. He knows he won't you know survive the fall. And and. Paul Newman, rather than trying to further convince him, um, agrees with him. <laughs> Says, well, you know, swim, the, the fall will kill you. <laughs> and so they jump. And it's a great scene because it's it's it brings us what we expected. It brings us something familiar. We've seen it in a bunch of movies. And then it turns it on its head. It gives us something different. It gives us a different approach. It gives us what uh, what's known in the business as a, um, a reversal uh, by sort of defying our expectations and then exceeding them. Uh, and then we still get the cool jumping off the cliff scene and the, and the good guys escape. We get everything we wanted and more. Um, a movie that's not very good that does this in one scene is a movie is a Bruce Willis vehicle post Die Hard called Mercury Rising. It's not a very good movie. Uh, he plays like a I think he's like a jaded burnout cop, you know, kind of role Bruce Willis would, you know, specialize in for, for a decade or more. Um, and he, he's protecting a little boy against some sort of evil corporate interest represented by uh, Alec Baldwin. And it's a largely forgettable movie. But what makes it wonderful is we come to the cliched scene, seen a million times, where the good guy finally comes face to face with the bad guy. And the bad guy explains to us, he explains to the hero and to us why he's doing what he's doing. He begins to explain his motives for being an evil bastard who wants to see this little boy dead. And he gets about half a sentence into his explanation and Bruce Willis punches him in the face and knocks him unconscious. And when I saw it with a movie audience, the audience cheered <laughs> because we didn't care why Alec Baldwin was doing what he was doing. <laughs> there was nothing that he was going to say that was going to justify his motives. And, and also, we're, movie audiences aren't stupid. We all know the language of cinema. We've all seen a million stories. We all knew where it was going. And yet, they, they stood the scene on its head. Uh, rather than have Alec Baldwin go on and on with his justifications, and smirking and boasting, uh, we just have Bruce Willis cold cocking into unconsciousness. And uh, it's a marvelous scene. And uh, for that reason, because they took the cliche, they took the trope, and they stood it on its head. And the audience appreciated it. Uh, and I imagine this is something that was come up with on the set. I doubt very much this is in the screenplay originally, because the rest of the screenplay is so by the numbers. 
uh, that there's no way this like out of whack reversal scene showed up in the middle of this when there was nothing else like that in the whole rest of the movie. Now, <clears throat> I talked about Westerns earlier resolving themselves through violence and conflict through violence. And I brought this movie up often. This is a movie that takes every Western cliche and completely upends it. It's called Warlock. It's a movie from the late 50s. Uh, it stars Henry Fonda, um, Anthony Quinn, and Richard Widmark. And it's a terrific Western shot at the Fox Ranch. Um, and it's it's kind of a version of the Wyatt Earp Doc Holliday story. It's the fabled legendary lawman and his ne'er-do-well gambling um, homicidal buddy. And there's no explaining, you know, well, how are these two men who are so different friends? I mean, that's always been the question. I mean, how, how could Wyatt Earp and Doc Holliday have been friends? They were such different personalities. They had such a different share, I mean, historically, a different view of the world and, and certainly different motives and certain diff different plans for their lives. And yet they were always associated with each other, always friends. This movie takes the unusual uh, step, particularly for a movie made in the late 50s, in that it's very, very clear that Anthony Quinn's feelings for Henry Fonda are more than just friendship, if you know what I mean. Um, there's a, there's a, this is an unrequited romance. And uh, Henry Fonda is never going to respond to Anthony Quinn's, you know, adoration of him. His obviously, Anthony Quinn is romantically infatuated with, Wyatt, with this Wyatt Earp figure. And Henry Fonda is, you know, basically seems to ignore it, seems to be oblivious to it, seems to uh, not acknowledge at all that Anthony Quinn's feelings toward him are more than friendly. Until we realize over the course of the film that Henry Fonda is very much aware of Anthony Quinn's feelings toward him and is not above using them and abusing them to manipulate Anthony Quinn into being an agent of violence for him so that he can maintain his legendary lawman, you know, hero of the West figure while Anthony Quinn does all the dirty work for him uh, out of, um, out of uh, an unabiding love for the Henry Fonda character. And, I mean, that's pretty, pretty innovative, pretty twisted, pretty dark, particularly for the period in which the film was made. Uh, but it's an effective story. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a wonderful Western. And it's also one of the very few Westerns in which the conflict at the end, the very end of the story, is not resolved through violence. I don't want to be a spoiler, but um, there's no climactic gunfight in this movie. And you don't want there to be one. By the time we reach that point in the story, we don't want to see the fate of the main characters in the story decided um, at the point of a gun. Uh, very, very interesting movie. And now, as far as cliches and tropes and all the rest, I mean, an example is uh, I have a new series, or new, it's a new book by me and Joe Bennett coming from the Ripperverse this summer called The Horseman. And it its evolution is that, you know, Joe contacted me when we were, we were in the middle of doing Alpha Core 1 and said, uh, you know what the Ripperverse needs? It needs a grounded in reality Batman Punisher type character. A guy doesn't have superpowers. Self-made man kind of guy, you know, who, who fights outside the law to, uh, to battle crime. And I said, cool, let me think about that. Now, now, the thing is, I've written Batman. I've written The Punisher. I've written lots of like vigilante justice stuff, both wearing masks and not. Um, you know, when you've written that stuff a lot, you're like, well, I don't want to write that again. Uh, what's a new take on that? What's a different take on that? And so I kind of took this character who, who is the horseman and I gave him a, a different kind of an origin, a different kind of motivations for what he does. Um, and you know, a bit more grounded in reality than either the Punisher or Batman. And, um, you know, 
I think the end result clicks. Uh, Joe's artwork certainly is blowing me away. I saw a bunch of new pages this week. That he's almost done with. He's almost done with the pencils on the project. It's absolutely mind blowing uh, work. So you know, that's the thing. I mean, you you can't embrace tropes and cliches, but you can't ignore them, especially when you're working in genre work, because that's what makes it a genre. Like I explained earlier, you know, Last Mohicans is not a Western. It wasn't trying to be a Western, uh, but, you know, something like Tombstone is a Western because it has to be a Western. It has to have the shootouts and the dusty streets and, you know, the, the huge panoramic views of the plains and all the rest of it um, because that's what the audience expects. But you've got to take their expectations and exceed them, you know, and that's the writer's job. You know, is there a better way to say this? Creeper Weirdo. I looked into the collections of Carl Barks Royce on Amazon, but the collections seem to skip volumes. Did I miss something or are there shenanigans afoot I'm not aware of? Yeah, Fantagraphics is doing a terrific job on these collections of Donald Duck and Uncle Scrooge comics by Carl Barks. It's lovingly restored. Uh, I could do without the, uh, the egghead pseudo-intellectual essays at the end of each book where the Writers seem to miss the point of every story, but um, but they're excellent. I mean, when I read them, I get them, and yes, they they are doing them out of order, and I think largely it's a publishing decision to present you know the best stuff first, uh, because they know the later volumes are going to sell less, uh, and so you don't want to do them in order necessarily. You want to like pick and choose through and 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 do the best stuff first. It's like you know, earlier in another video, I was talking about when uh, Dean Mullaney decided he wanted to do um, Little Orphan Annie, the, the reprint the comic strip, these beautiful hardcover volumes, and and he's do, he he did the Lord's work in doing that. Uh, I certainly appreciated it, but his question was, you know, do I begin in in I think 26, 1926, when the strip began, or do I begin in 1934 when the strip really took off and really got really good it's it's peak era um through the late 30s into the early 40s this is, is and then and then uh do i start there in 34 and then go back later and he realized you know if i go back later the sales are going to be much lower and he just bit the bullet and, and started the strip from the beginning which i'm glad he did because i mean from the beginning Lou orphan annie was an amazing strip uh yes it go, got a whole lot better but um you know, I still wanted to read all of it. And I still enjoyed all of it. And same thing with Barks. I want to read all of Barks. I want to read lesser Barks and best Barks because any Barks is good Barks. Any Barks, you know, the 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 the, the least of Barks' stories are still head and shoulders above anything else anyone else anyone else did. Uh so yeah, I want to see it all. But you know, you there are publishing considerations. Uh because you know publishing is a business, you gotta earn money and you got and 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 to their credit, Fantagraphics wants to reprint all of Barks' duck work. And in order to do that, they had to make certain decisions of what order to do the stuff in based on sales. Uh, so that they, they can complete the series. It's not like when they did the complete peanuts, and yeah, everybody wants every, you know, you do it in order and you do all of them because it's peanuts. You know, uh, with Barks, it's 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 different. There's different you know, Barks fans will tell you there's different eras in Barks because he, he did the Ducks for so long. So I think that, I think these, you know, I'm, I'm just guessing it, it was a, a business decision. Another creeper weirdo. What are some of the great 1970s action movies worth getting and watching? Well, I, you can't go wrong with Bruce Lee, Enter the Dragon. Uh, I mean, I was going to the movies a lot in this phase. Uh, the Kung Fu movie kind of took over the theaters. You know, if, you, if I went down to downtown Philly, you know, there, you could go to four different theaters and see a triple bill of kung fu movies in each one of them. Uh, and but of course, Lee Lee owned uh, that genre, and Enter the Dragon is, um, you know, I mean, I'm not saying anything anybody else hasn't said a million times. It it is the peak for uh, the way it was filmed, his fighting techniques, his charisma. And all the things that made Bruce Lee, Bruce Lee are here in Enter the Dragon. And it's also very, very 70s movie uh, from the music to uh, the 
partial nudity to all, all the rest of it, a classic 70s R-rated film. Um, now, the other uh, big trend in the 70s at the uh, Grindhouses was the black exploitation movie, and they don't get better than Truck Turner. Uh, Isaac Hayes plays a, a bounty hunter uh, who doesn't seem to care where uh, he fires his gun. <laughs> it's a, there's barely any story. There's barely any plots in this movie, but you really don't care because Hayes really is extremely charismatic as uh, this sort of deadpan stoic uh, gunman, you know, wandering around L.A. Uh, looking for his quarry in exchange for bucks. It's a particularly memorable shootout in a hospital operating room, just to give you an idea. Uh, now, the studios, because they were making so much money off the black exploitation movies, I mean, they really... And the thing is, they call it black exploitation, but let's face it, action film fans of all colors, creeds, and <laughs> religious beliefs were going to see these movies. I, I, was, I went to see all of them because they were shoot-em-ups. I, I didn't care if the cast was primarily African-American and all the bad guys were white guys. Uh, I just wanted to see a shoot-em-up. And um, so Hollywood embraced these in a big way because they didn't cost much money to make, and they were earners. But you had some examples like this movie, Across 110th Street, which, uh, hey, here's Anthony Quinn again. Uh, Anthony Quinn and Yafet Kodo are New York cops who are at odds. They're, and Anthony Quinn is an unapologetic racist and uh, worried about his own career. He's also corrupt as hell. And they are to investigate a, um, a gang of African-Americans who pulled an armed robbery on a mafia counting house and they steal a half million dollars from the Italian mob. And the movie's got a terrific soundtrack by Bobby Womack, fantastic theme song, all shot on location in New York. Just the, 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 for me, the ultimate, other than the French Connection, the ultimate 1970s New York set crime story was the seedy streets piled with trash, the, you know, the horrible conditions that Harlem was in at the time, and uh, terrific action scenes. Tony Franciosa playing way over the top as this you know, vile mafioso uh, assigned with hunting down the uh, the guys who stole the mafia's money and uh, the horrible things that happened to those guys. But it's a, it's an awesome uh, crime period action film with some terrific action and, and higher production values than the usual black exploitation film because I think the studio saw this, I believe it was MGM, saw this as an A picture, not just a, you know, part of a double feature. Uh, Another one, um, they began to import French action films here. And of course, when you do that, Jean-Paul Belmondo is king. I remember seeing this movie in France. It's called Fear of the City. Uh, it was released here under the name Nightcaller. Belmondo is a tough French cop. And when it comes to tough cops, they don't come tougher than French tough cops. The French were masters at police thrillers. They still are to this day, still make the best police action films ever made. And Nightcaller is a good one. It's a cat and mouse game between Belmondo as a uh, Paris police detective hunting for a serial killer uh, who uh, torments his um, victims by phone calls before showing up to murder them. And uh, Belmondo does all of his usual daring, daring stunts, uh, you know, rooftop chases, car chases, all the rest, and shot in the Belmondo style where he makes sure you know it's him. There are no stunt doubles. It's him doing all the crazy stunt work, extremely dangerous stunt work, because uh, he wanted audiences to know uh, he was the one out there hanging his ass out over the streets of Paris. Uh, but there, there's lots of good Belmondo films, but a lot of them didn't make it here to the United States. Another guy that owned the 70s was Bronson. Bronson made a series of action films, you know, Death Wish, all the rest. He made westerns. He made police thrillers. But to me, the best one is Mr. Majestic. It's the most simple story you can possibly imagine. Uh, Majestic owns a watermelon farm. All he cares about is getting his watermelon crop in in Southern California. And uh, he ends up getting arrested and put in jail with um, Al Leota, a, uh, a mafia guy. And uh, both of them participate in a escape and things get complicated 
and uh, Bronson has to sell everything with a shotgun. So uh, what more do you need? You don't need to know any more than that. Now another one, this one's this one's coming out recent, recently. Somebody, uh, some studio has taken this and restored this film. It's called Rolling Thunder. It stars William Devane and Tommy Lee Jones as a pair of Vietnam POWs who are returned to their lives in uh, Arizona or Mexico, someplace like that. And uh, they try to uh, assimilate back into society, but it's impossible because of the horrible traumatic events they, they endured in a uh, Vietnamese prison camp. And uh, things go from bad to worse when uh, a gang led by James Best um, kill uh, Devane's uh, son and, and wife. Uh, in a, you know, botched home invasion. And uh, Devane just decides to hunt them down into Mexico. This this movie is just, just mean, uh, top drawer, 1970s exploitation. Uh, just unapologetically nasty revenge film uh, that, you know, it's, it's really worth seeing. I, will, I won't ruin the, there's just a terrific scene between him and Tommy Lee Jones uh, that I will not ruin, except to say that it's, it's the scene where William Devane goes, ask Tommy Lee Jones for his help in finding the men who, who killed his family. And uh, it's just um, a genius piece of writing. The Getaway, uh, directed by Sam Peckinpah, starts Steve McQueen, Ali McGraw, Ben Johnson, and uh, again, Al Letary from Mr. Majestic uh, as another crazed, um, mafioso. Uh, the Getaway is another, once again, simple um, story. Steve McQueen is a master at bank robberies. Bank robbery goes horribly wrong. The rest of the movie is a deconstruction as he and Ali McGraw uh, try to escape across Texas for the Mexican border. And uh, complications ensue because uh, McQueen feels that um, in, in a lot of ways, Alan McGraw has betrayed him in the past. So their marriage is on the rocks uh, while, while they are, they are uh, fighting their way across uh, the Big Ben country to get the hell out of the United States. Now, for 70s sleaze, you, you, you got to go, 70s sleaze action films, got to go to Prime Cut. It stars Gene Hackman, Lee Marvin. They are both gangsters out of Kansas City. Uh, Missouri, and uh, Gene Hackman is running a uh, basically a, a, a white slavery ring, what we call human trafficking today. Uh, he's running a white slavery ring out in the uh, the uh, rural areas of of Kansas, and um, he's getting a little out of line for the uh, syndicate back in Kansas City, and so they send uh, Lee Marvin out there to straighten him out. And um, it's just a terrifically violent uh, film, uh, Marvin and Hackman at their best. Uh, some unforgettable stuff, uh, darkly humorous, depending on your sense of humor. And um, just like I said, a slice of 1970s uh, action sleaze. Uh, it's, you, you're, when you're watching it, you're like, I can't believe this is an A studio release. <laughs> It's like the movie, the movie studios were just so desperate to find an audience that they would just dip into the gutter as deep. You know, I mean, you know, Quentin Tarantino came from somewhere <laughs> and he came from movies like this. Uh, now, now a little more uh, highbrow is Sorcerer. Uh, Sorcerer is an art house film, but it's also an awesome action film. Uh, it's William Friedkin's uh, failed uh, adventure film, but failed only at the box office. It's a remake of the French film Wages of Fear. And uh, I don't want to shock film fans by saying, is it, is it a Wages of Fear as good as it is? Sorcerer is a vast improvement on it. Once again, simple story. Four men who are on the run end up in a uh, Central American hellhole of a country with no prospects. And they volunteer to drive two trucks full of dynamite to an oil fire deep in the jungle and everything that happens to them. This movie's as excruciating as far as suspense. It's a nail biter throughout. Uh, it's got some fantastic performances. Um, cast led by Rob Schneider, 
Rob, Rob Schneider. Led by Roy Scheider. Rob Schneider. Rob Schneider should be in the remake. Uh, you know, it's read by, I'm having a problem with names today, friends. Uh, it's Roy Scheider and uh, Bruno Kremer. And, you know, just terrific stuff. Absolutely terrific stuff. And uh, it, it, some of these scenes had to be seen to be believed. Um, a, a extraordinarily dangerous uh, shoot. Um, movie bombed. It was a huge failure at the box office, uh, which is a shame because Steve McQueen wanted to be in it and couldn't come to an agreement with Friedkin. And uh, Friedkin was holding out for some sort of artistic reasons. Didn't want McQueen... Uh, because McQueen wanted to change where the film would be shot. And um, Friedkin admitted that for years he kicked himself in the ass because if McQueen had been in this movie, it, it would have been made $100 million at the box office. But, uh, but it, it, you got to check it out if you've never seen it. Really good. Now, again, once again, a highbrow action film, Who'll Stop the Rain, starring Nick Nolte and Tuesday Well. Uh, Nick Nolte, he, he agrees to help a friend smuggle some heroin, out of Vietnam uh, in the in the seventies, and um, they run afoul of the guys who basically were financing the operation, and they want the heroin and they don't want to pay for it. And uh, <clears throat> so Nick Nolte has to protect his friend's wife, played by Tuesday Weld. And um, it's it's often been called a thinking man's action film, and I can't think of a better um, description than that. It's uh, just just awesome, and and it basically uh, assured Nick Nolte his star power, even though it wasn't a huge hit or anything else. Uh, critics began to take a second look at him as a guy who, um, you know, um, you know, has an enormous amount of screen persona, and you know, eventually, you know, starred him. But um, those are the top seventies. So There's a lot of great seventies action films, but the that's the cream of the crop as far as I'm concerned. If you want to check them out, if you can find them. Hey, um, one more thing. <laughs> this isn't an answer to a question or anything else. It's sort of an adjunct to a question that was asked in an earlier video. When the John Aston episodes of Batman, the 1966 series, when the episodes in which John Aston played the Riddler came up and um, someone accused me of stealing uh, some elements from it, uh, including a uh, bank robbery committed using scuba gear and some of the clues, the crossword clues, and uh, some of the riddles uh, that I had lifted them when I wrote um, this Detective Comics annual, which presented Riddler Year One. And uh, the person said that I had stolen the ideas from the John Aston episodes. And... Uh, I confess I didn't remember, and, 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 I, and I confess that perhaps, perhaps I did steal the ideas from the episode, but it wasn't consciously. I must have seen the episodes. I do vividly remember seeing the episodes, but I don't, didn't remember anything about them uh, other than that John Aston, while I'm a big John Aston fan, uh, was not equal to Frank Gorshin as the Riddler. Um, and so I kind of felt bad. I thought, well, you know, I've, I've unconsciously stolen ideas from that. But then somebody uh, on YouTube, they posted below the video and said, no, you, it's, it, you didn't steal them from the John Aston episode. You took them from the first appearance of the Riddler. And which makes it okay, because I was writing Riddler year one. I must have gone back, because I really couldn't remember the Aston episode. I must have gone back and looked at Riddler's earliest appearances uh, to get an idea of, you know, what to represent, what stories to retell for the year one story. And so I am vindicated. I am vindicated because all of the things mentioned by the original question asker, the uh, the crossword puzzle, uh, the nature of some of the riddles, the scuba diver uh, robbery, the, uh, the underwater robbery of a bank vault, these all appear in the original uh, first appearance of the Riddler back in the golden age. And so I was not stealing from a TV show. I was homaging a comic book story. And while yes, they weren't my ideas, I was writing a Batman year one story. And so I am retelling the origin of the Riddler. And so it was all fair game. So I didn't plagiarize. I um, did my job. 
<laughs> hey, if you have anything else you want to accuse me of, you can go to Bruno Bookstore at gmail.com. Bruno Bookstore at gmail.com is the best way to reach me. It's the most direct way to reach me. Uh, obviously, I read the YouTube comments and stuff like that. But uh, I'm even there, even in the dialogues below this video, I might miss your uh, submission. But I won't miss it if you send it to Bruno Bookstore at gmail.com. And while I got you, and while we were talking about you know vigilante justice stories, Levon Scourge, book 12 in my Levon Cade series, is out. It's on Kindle. It's in paperback. Coming soon to audio books. It's selling very well. I'm very, very happy with it. If you haven't checked out Levon, uh, you can start at the beginning with book one and uh, know that you have 11 more books ahead of you. The saga of Levon Cade and his family and uh, the blood-soaked trail he leaves behind himself. Hey, I want to thank you for listening. I want to thank you for watching. I want to thank you for subscribing and liking and sharing uh, this website with your friends. And uh, I'll see all of you down the road.